Hello, anatomy and physiology students. This is your teacher coming to you with um, the first of a couple videos that's going to wrap up our course of anatomy and physiology one. It is Tuesday, 11 19, November 19th here in Somerset, a little bit rainy today. With chapter 11, I hope to give you a concise summary and overview of this chapter. It's a lot of information, but you're going to be surprised about how much you already know. What we are going to talk about is uh, obviously the functions of the nervous system. Um, then we're going to talk about how it's divided up in terms of anatomical structures and in terms of how it functions, the jobs that different parts have. We'll review some of the cell types. We'll add to our knowledge of the neuron. We'll add to our knowledge of action potentials and resting membrane potentials and even the synapse. And then hopefully we'll learn a little bit something new about these uh, neuronal pathways. So stick around. This should take about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm going to keep it short for you. Functions of the nervous system. You might think it's pretty easy to, to summarize these. Think about um, <clears throat> how we detect light. First of all, we have cells that can receive light signals or uh, energy changes from photons floating around. A photon is a particle of light. Uh, we have certain specialized cells that can receive that signal and then transmit it to our brain for processing. Uh, integration is where we would take the information that came from our eyes, process it, and then perceive the sight that we're seeing. Motor output would be if, I, if I'm looking at an ice cream cone, I'm going to need to locomote or move my legs to go towards that stimuli. Homeostasis could be anything from breathing, heart rate regulation, to hormonal regulation, and uh, the processes that take care of that to keep us stable. And then mental activity. So if I want to say, oh, this ice cream is so tasty, or I love strawberries, or if I want to create some art and language, or some uh, ab subjective or objective, that's the word I'm looking for, language, emotions, higher thought, that's think thankful to um, some other parts of our brain. And um, obviously the system is involved in those functions. So we're going to try to discern how they work. In terms of uh, anatomy of the nervous system, it's not too much to it. Um, right now we're just taking a quick overview. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are the two major categories, anatomical divisions. Central nervous system contains the brain and the spinal cord only. Peripheral nervous system contains everything else, anything that's not part of the brain and not part of the spinal cord. So that includes cranial nerves, that includes uh, any nerves that come off the spinal cord and uh, provide innervation to other parts of the body. Take note, when we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, I think it's important to distinguish that, uh, for example, this model, I removed some of it here. This is all part of the brain. We got the brain stem, these lobes out here, cerebellum that should be in the back. They are here. Something like that, maybe. Oh. Parts of the central nervous system, but uh, if you look closely, I have the olfactory nerve here. This is cranial nerve one. There's 12 total. This goes to our nose and our spelling sense, uh, deep into some part of our brain that can process the information that came from our nose. So this is a cranial nerve, but it's also part of the peripheral nervous system. It, it's, hard to, it's hard to kind of remember that sometimes because it's right here crammed up against our brain along with a bunch of other uh, cranial nerves that might be branching off of this. Still, even though it looks like it may be part of the central, it is considered part of the peripheral nervous system, the cranial nerves are. Cells in the nervous system. There's two main categories, neurons and glial cells. Neurons are the functional unit of the nervous system. They are the cells that can be excited. You can have um, signal propagated through them and a response elicited. And everybody should be pretty familiar with the basic parts of a neuron. There's a lot going on in this picture, but we got the dendrites. Remember the root word that that came from was the Greek word for tree. Um, we have the axon, this long thing coming off of the third and final part, the cell body. What we haven't talked about really in this class so far is the myelin sheath you see pictured here. Not all axons will have this, okay? And then we'll talk about its function here in a minute, but that's really what we're adding new. You can have different types of neurons. 
Uh, here's a good picture from our textbook. Multipolar neuron. What I would imagine is the most common. I think that's on my next slide. Um, interneuron is the most common. The middleman. But some are going to be more geared towards uh, sending one signal out to multiple, for example, motor units in our muscles, or many sensory dendrites on our fingertips, allowing us to receive high definition information to our brain. That is a bunch, a bunch of uh, dendrites converging to a single axon. So I would encourage you to review these different types of um, neurons where you might find those at based on the examples I just talked about and um, review this part of the chapter a little bit more in depth on your own time. The other type of cell in the nervous system is called glial cells and there's a bunch of cells that we can count underneath this umbrella. I don't want you to learn all these right now but I do want you to be familiar with them. Astrocytes, microglia, and oleodendrocytes. These are cells that support neurons so they might provide structural support or they might be gatekeepers about what goes in and out of a neuron. Some might be involved in um, immune response. These ependymal cells are responsible for filtering and producing the cerebral spinal fluid that our brain and spinal cord kind of float in. When we talk about those structures more in depth later, we'll learn about the meninges and the membranes that cover these things. Overall though, right now, you should be getting yourself familiar with their basic names and functions and then make sure you're able to tell me uh, I'm going to ask you to make sure you can tell me, you know, Schwann cells are part of the peripheral nervous system. Schwann cells create myelin. And so that, therefore, you're only going to find myelinated axons in the peripheral nervous system. That's the kind of chain of thought I want you to get towards. One uh, example I came across in my time in the neurosurgery clinic was a couple patients I remember had some hearing loss, I think it was. And so they're finally at the neurosurgeon's office getting a consult and, you know, we might have had to tell them they had a schwannoma, which would be a tumor, the oma. It's a tumor of the Schwann cells. And so that would be a peripheral nervous system type tumor rather than a central nervous system type tumor. But it's still located right up in here close to the brain. There's some distinctions there that I think we should uh, be able to make. A couple important terms here for this next section terms, uh, let me get my laser pointer back up here, terms whoa. Uh, that's, you just need to know from this chapter and as a, as a nurse or healthcare provider studying anatomy and also to help you in the next coming couple of chapters. So get in your head now, just like the rest and digest and the fight or flight stuff I was talking about earlier, that gray matter is um, unmyelinated neurons. There's no myelin sheath. There's no Schwann cells. Myelinated nervous tissue is white matter. Um, and there's a mixture of white and gray matter in our spinal cord and in our brain. But in general, gray matter is um, unmyelinated and meant for more integration between neurons, in my opinion, that are closely situated to each other. So if I look uh, at the tracks that connect cerebral hemispheres, I see white and gray matter in there. But really no myelin going on because um, a lot, you know, there's not as much myelin you would see as other parts of the area, but um, they're, they're real close. They're talking all together at one time. They don't need something that just makes it talk faster. However, if you look at uh, an axon that goes from the tip of my toe all the way up to my brain or to my spinal cord, that section is going to be myelinated so that I can perceive signals faster from way down there up here. I'll talk more about how it's faster here in a second, but um, it's going to be myelinated. It's going to be a white matter. And this is really apparent in the spinal cord, in my opinion. Other terms like cortex and nuclei, ganglia, and nerves. Cortex, I think of as a layer. Um, and our brain has an outer cortex that provides us higher executive functioning and things like that. And a group of cells within the brain is called, or within the central nervous system, is called the nuclei. Um, if it's a group of cells or a group of neurons that have the same function outside of the CNS, we call it a ganglia. And then uh, nerves out in the PNS are going to be white, they're going to be myelinated. So overall, 
white and gray matter in both sections of the nervous system. Um, but when we start looking at some anatomical pictures of them in the next video, it'll, that'll come back and make a little more sense. Right now, just get down gray matter, unmyelinated, white matter is myelinated, and you'll be okay. So electric, electrical signals in uh, neurons or cells, let's make sure we can recall um, what's going on with the cell overall. Sorry, I just got something straight up in my eye. <laughs> um, sodium, Na here most concentrated outside of the cell. Let me get my picture up here in a second. And then at resting membrane potential, potassium is more concentrated inside of the cell. I know that these two ions here have a little positive charge up top, but don't let that get you confused about what's going on for the overall environment inside and outside of the cell. Uh, what we have learned so far is that um, for a neuron, this is not, you know, really great a neuron, but it is a cell here. When it's resting, there's an ion gradient. And then when an actual potential leaves, that they are going to flip. So just like you see on the screen here, this is what we've learned already. We're familiar with this chart of depolarization and repolarization in this threshold membrane. What I want to add to that is refractory period. Okay. This simply gives the neuron a chance to reset and does not allow signals like this to overlap in, if there were a bunch of waves here. So there's, um, I was told an interesting analogy of this refractory or refractory period a little while back. Think of it like a, a squirt gun. You have to squeeze the trigger to get water to squirt out, but then there's a period of time where you have to wait before you can squeeze it again. And um, that's what's going on with this um, refractory period. It takes time for those sodium and potassium ions to get back to their original places once they've been flipped. And um, that time allows for resetting and for not overlapping of those signals. We've talked about depolarization and what I was explaining in the second to last slide, this uh, gradient here uh, in this electrical discharge and how cells sit at a resting membrane potential. And now uh, we've talked about these ions. So you're, you're familiar with depolarization. That can be one way that this changes, it depolarizes. Let's talk about hyperpolarization for a second. We can do, um, neurons are able to kind of edge themselves up towards the threshold or edge themselves away from the threshold based on these hyperpolarization or depolarization ideas. Um, in hyperpolarization, the new one that we're learning right now, we still have that normal concentration gradient, um, but it's a little bit modified in that there's going to be more uh, potassium leaking out of the cell than usual, and there's going to be a little more chloride ions inside of the cell or coming inside the cell as than usual. And um, if it's regularly threshold or resting member potential of negative 70, extra potassium outside of the cell and extra chloride ions inside the cell is going to push that resting threshold membrane lower, keep it down here. What this does is provide that neuron a little bit of time or a little bit of delay possible before the threshold's met if there's a change. And that's good if we want to do something like inhibit a signal or speed up a signal, we can, we can flip the ions around a little more to, to make this depolarization a little bit closer here or the threshold, we can bring it down a little bit closer to here, or we can move it up a little way from this moment, wherever it's resting at. I talked about uh, signal propagation happening faster, for example, from my toe to my spinal cord, if I'm stepping on something hot or sharp. That is what we would see here in a myelinated axon, and we call it saltatory, because saltatory means to jump and that myelin sheath and these nodes of Rainier that we've seen on a few diagrams allows for this signal to kind of jump or propagate in a faster manner. Just is faster for some reason. There's a little bit of details about why that's going on in here, but I'm going to gloss over those for now. Just make sure I've explained at least these two basic concepts in signal propagation. We just talked about saltatory, but we've already been learning about continuous conduction uh, down a normal you know, everyday acts on through the muscle chapters and what we've talked about so far in this lecture. 
<clears throat> I need to go forward a little bit here. Uh, at the synapse, we have already talked about a chemical synapse uh, in terms of acetylcholine causing muscle contraction. Um, but we can also talk about other neurotransmitters that might be kind of pre-staged here that will allow this to happen faster. For example, if a neuron um, or a presynaptic membrane has a little bit more chloride in it, it's a little bit more negative, that could be a little bit of an inhibiting factor in terms of it reaching its threshold when it's time to send a signal out. So neurotransmitters can be excitatory, cause things to be a little more volatile and ready to go. And then inhibitory can cause things to be a little bit more attenuated and have a little bit longer response if we need to control those in terms of a hormone or you know, anything else that the brain and the spinal cord nervous system is doing. Finally, we got neuronal pathways and circuits. There's only four of them here. This is just super neat. Whenever I start looking at this stuff, I think about logic gates or computer programming. Um, but there's four major types of pathways or circuits that we want to look at. Let me get a picture of all four of them here. I don't have a picture of all four. I'm sorry. The first two are what we would call convergent pathway and divergent pathway. Notice here in convergent, we have many neurons signaling ultimately what's going to be one. And then over here, we have one neuron signaling what's ultimately going to be propagated to many. So it's diverging and then it is converging on this side. An example of converging would be the rods in our eyes being stimulated by light. They will all converge into an optic nerve that will go into our brain where we can integrate it and process it and think about it. Uh, a divergent pathway, a good example of that would be some axons or a axon coming off of the spinal cord and then it splits to either recruit a couple motor units at the same time or a section of muscles or a section of a muscle. You can see how it kind of starts as one and might fan out to more than one in this picture. It's not the best illustration, but it gives you an idea. These other two um, are pretty, pretty cool as well. The reverberating circuit can also be called an oscillating circuit. And so hopefully I won't goof this up by explaining it, but think about um, the breathing response here. So if I want to breathe, I have to have my chest muscles expand my chest wall and my diaphragm expand inside. And that goes. So these might be finished relaxing first. This one might need to take a little bit more time to get relaxed in terms of that signal going through. Uh, but this one's gonna start again. And then if I'm able to start that with a single neuron and have some other ones down the chain do it in a delayed fashion, it kind of gives a rhythm for these things to be working just enough where everything goes together for me to be able to get a breath in and a breath out. And then this other one over here is Pretty rare and complex. I don't know if it's rare, but I know it's the most complex of all these pathways we've talked about. It's good for things like uh, that allow sustained or prolonged control, concentration, difficult mental task or activities. It provides the advantage of being able to send a signal from one neuron to another in maybe a short, fast pathway or something that's a little bit more delayed or takes a little bit longer to get there and it can kind of alternate depending on what's needed. It's amazing, I know. But if you are totally confused by everything I just said, I've summarized it here. Uh, you wanna make sure you can give me an example of some where these are gonna be found at though, not just what they do, what's going on with the neurons, but also where, where might you find these things happening at? Okay, I think that covers it. We have covered most of the stuff that's on this slide specifically the anatomical divisions, the functional divisions, the types of neurons that we now know about, what we've added to our action potential and resting membrane potential knowledge, and then that new idea about circuit pathways. Uh, hopefully next um, video, I'm gonna be talking briefly about spinal cord and reflexes and uh, expand on these pathways a little bit. I am also include the brain and spinal cord anatomy there. And uh, here's the references for all the material I used in this slide. Hope everybody has a great rest of your week. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Please contact me if you need anything. You know where I'm at. Bye.